question, what keeps you from listening well to a good friend or spouse? We introduced that question last week, and we have the responses for you. Can we go to the next slide? As you can see, the top vote getter there was, I'm rushed. I'm rushed. Close second was thinking about what I'm going to say to you. What was interesting in this is that only distractions only got 8%. You know, I would think these days with cell phones and how they go off all the time, it seems like, that uh, that would be higher, or the iPads, or what all the stuff that we have with technology. Well, 18% of you texted in some responses, and here we have on the screen some of them. Probably won't get through all of them. Some were very honest. I just don't care. <laughs> it's never enough. And not interested in the topic. In the Bible, in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 19, it says that you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. We all most likely can improve the way that we listen to others. But I want us to consider for a moment this morning that listening well involves more than just listening. Listening well involves more than just listening. It's really hard to listen well, isn't it? It can be hard to always understand what the other person is even trying to say or get at. Sometimes we might even think that the person is just babbling on and on and on. That it's all just a bunch of babble. Actually, that word babble has its roots in the Bible. In Genesis 11, we see a bunch of people who were, interest, who were prideful, wanting to make a name for themselves rather than for God. They were building a tower that represented this rebellious attitude. Now, as pastors, there are times when we consult a variety of resources to explain the meaning of Bible passages. The resource I want to use and read from today is called the Jesus Storybook. This is how the children's Bible describes this event. They were trying to live without God, but God knew that wouldn't make him very happy or safe or anything. If they kept on like this, they would only destroy themselves. And God loved them too much to let that happen, so he stopped their plans. One morning they went to work as usual, but everything was different. Their words were all new and funny. You see, God had given each person a completely different language. Suddenly, no one understood what anyone else was saying. Someone would say, how do you do? And the other person thought they said, how ugly are you? It wasn't funny. You could be saying something nice, such as, such a lovely morning, morning and get punched in the nose because they thought you said, hush up, you're boring. You couldn't even say pardon to check to see if you heard right because no one understood that word either. After that, people scattered all over the world, which is how we ended up with so many different languages to this day. They scattered because they couldn't understand one another. Do you ever feel like scattering because you can't understand the other person? And that person happens to be your spouse? Listening well involves more than just listening. It involves understanding the other person and understanding yourself. Let's begin with understanding the other person. Men and women are different. It reminds me of the story of the little boy who wanted to be involved in the play at school. He went, tried out, and he came running home. He ran in the house, and there was his dad. Dad, dad, guess what? I got a part in the play at school. His father said, well, what part did you get, son? Dad, I got the part of a dad. His father paused for a moment and thought and said, son, I want you to go back to school tomorrow. Talk to the person in charge of the play and ask them if you could have a speaking role. <laughs> well, one of the key foundations to begin with is that men and women are different. I realize that we can ma make uh, too much of the differences at times, but we can also make a mistake of making too little of the differences as well. And you know what? Those differences have been with us since the beginning. 
Since the beginning when God created us. Let's turn back to Genesis and take a look. It says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image. So he created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. We see this idea of male and female again in Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. If you turn over to the New Testament, you see it in Matthew chapter 19, verse 4, which says, Haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus said? They record from the beginning that God made them male and female. From the very beginning in Genesis, when God created the man and the woman, we see the reality that we are different by design. Different by design. Well, let's take a look at the man. Genesis 2, 7 says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and he became a living person. That word for formed is the Hebrew word yastar. It is the idea of being squeezed into a shape or molded into a form. Well, let's take a look at the woman. When it comes to her, we see in Genesis 2.22, Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. Now the word made is not the same word as it was used with the man. It's not the word yastar, but the word bana. The word can be translated as fashioned. It descri describes a completely different design. And there is a complexity in the design of a woman. Dr. Walt Lairmore says, in other scripture references where bana is used, it describes the intricate design of the temple or altar. You could say that the craftsman banad Sol Solomon's temple, that it was made with intricacy and delicacy and attention to fine detail. Man was squeezed or molded like clay by the creator's hand, but the woman was designed and crafted. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. From conception onward, male and female, his brain and her brain, Scripture and now even science points to the discovery that a man and woman's brain is distinctly different. Dr. Walt Lairmore, in his best -selling, who is a best-selling author and family physician, he has written his excellent book, His Brain, Her Brain. In it, he says this, The differences between men and women are not something we imagine. They are not volitional choices we make just to annoy each other. They're not simply due to personality quirks. Many, if not most, of these dissimilarities have to do with the distinctive ways his brain and her brain functions. Dr. Larimore goes on to say that a mountain of research published during the last two decades reveals the dra dramatic anatomical, chemical, hormonal, and physiological differences that impact us how we think, our emotions, and how we behave from children all the way up through adults. The geneticist, Dr. Anne Moi, in her book, The Real Differences Between Men and Women, says, men and women are different. They're equal only in their common membership in the same species, humankind. To maintain that they are the same in aptitude, skill, or behavior is to build a society based on a bio biological and scientific law. In his book, Laramore gives a diagram that you see on the screen. It shows the different hormones in the brain and which ones are high and low in men and which ones are high and low in women. Isn't it amazing, the contrast? Testosterone impacts a man's behavior. It's, his major, it's a major male hormone. But as a mood regulator, testosterone is a midget when it's compared to a woman's hormones of estrogen and progesterone. Nevertheless, testosterone is the hormone most associated with male aggressiveness, competitiveness, assertiveness, and his ability to focus 
and not become distracted. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Women, you may have noticed his ability to, at times to focus so intently that he's not easily distracted. You know, when you're trying to talk to him and he doesn't seem to hear you. And for some of you might discover that this afternoon watching the game. He's focused, he's intent. Thank goodness for on the remotes where they have that pause button and you can stop it to wait to answer your wife. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Men and women have different responses to stress. A man's propensity is to react with anger. His brain connections send his emotional responses downward towards his body and physical responses. Her brain is more inclined to process her emotional responses upward toward her brain's verbal, relational, and contemplation centers. Fearfully and wonderfully made. In response to stress, women tend to think and feel before acting. Men, on the other hand, seem to be hardwired to act first and deal with their thoughts later. Feelings, if they come, are a distant third. You know, there's some great books out there that are being published these days that really highlight some of the differences of men and women and just differences in general. They're often available out in a, our bookstore on a regular basis. Well, listening well involves more than just listening. It involves more than just understanding the other person. It also involves understanding yourself. Many pastors, when we perform a wedding ceremony, we include the passage, Genesis 2.24, which says, A man leaves his father and his mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one, or one flesh. We like to highlight the point that the two will become one flesh. And while it is bad math, it makes for great chemistry. And while that paints a picture of relational and spiritual and physical oneness, there's a dark side that we as pastors fail to bring to light. And that is that we are ultimately selfish at the core of who we are. And we see that, that um, picture of oneness shattered in the very next chapter in Genesis chapter 3, which introduces what we call the fall, or how sin came into the world. It is where we see disobedience to God's plan by Adam and by Eve that rebellion, ultimate selfishness or sin, is doing what they wanted rather than what God had asked of them. That decision distorted and broke the unity that they had with God and with each other. Let's take a peek back at Genesis 3. The woman was being tempted by the serpent to eat the fruit. It says the woman was convinced she saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. She took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some of her to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. You and I come into marriage as self centered and selfish individuals. We're going to look at a clip now by Paul Tripp, who explains this just a little bit more. Well, I have to admit, I'm the writer of a marriage book who hates marriage books. Uh, because I, I don't think that often those books get at what the real difficulties of marriage are about. They're, they're not about sex, or not about finances, or parenting or what's the job of a husband and what's the job of a wife. Rather than being the cause of the problem, those are the locations where the problem reveals itself. The problem really does exist down at a deeper level. What did you expect is about helping people who, who are in marriage or planning on getting married to understand that deeper level, to understand that each of us carry into our marriages something that is fundamentally destructive to relationships. The Bible actually names it. It's called sin. Sin in its fundamental form is selfish. And so it puts inside of me antisocial instincts that are destructive to relationships. 
you get at that, you begin to humbly admit that you are your greatest marriage difficulty and you begin to commit yourself to certain things that you will do again and again, you are on the pathway to real change in your marriage. Dr. Tripp, marriage according to the Bible will always involve two flawed people living with each other in a fallen world. And the majority of couples enter into marriage with unrealistic perspectives and expectations, leaving them unprepared for the day-to-day realities of married life. One author says it this way, the real transforming work of marriage is the 24 hours a day, seven days a week commitment, this crucible that grinds and shapes us into the character of Jesus Christ. Instead of getting up at 3 a.m. to begin prayer in a monastery, the question becomes, who will wake up when the baby's diaper needs to be changed? We don't want to be bothered. We want to be served. We don't want to have to serve someone else. But God wants to change our character, our attitudes, and our behavior. How we see and how we relate with one another. Not with an attitude of superiority or self-centeredness, but one of how we can serve the other person. And that's true whether it's in marriage or in other relationships that we're involved with. In Philippians 2, it says, Don't be selfish. Don't try to, be, to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that was in Christ Jesus, that Christ Jesus had. You and I need to realize that it's more about changing ourselves than changing our spouses. Focus on changing yourself and not your spouse. Marriage calls us into an entirely new, selfless type of life. Gary Thomas has said that any situation that causes me me to confront my selfishness has enormous, enormous spiritual value. And I would imagine that there is a tremendous amount of immaturity within each of us. And that marriage directly exposes it and confronts it, doesn't it? It is in marriage relationship with a person that is so close that it begins to reveal the heart nature of our actions and our attitudes. Our spouse is not a neighbor five doors down that we can just kind of drive on by and ignore. They are individuals who sit with us at meals, who sleep only a few feet away in bed. And sometimes that few feet seems more like miles, doesn't it? Over time, when there is no personal, regular habit of connecting with God and keeping a clean slate with your spouse, it can become easy to descend into a sort of a marital guerrilla warfare, passive-aggressive power plays, where each of you blames the other person for personal dissatisfaction or the lack of excitement in your marriage. Some couples decide just simply to to get along. They're going to survive, not seek to thrive in their marriage. And when that starts to happen in your marriage, you you, you don't give each other the benefit of the doubt. You don't believe that the other person has goodwill intentions with what they did. You believe that they actually did it to kind of stick it to you. They did it on purpose, didn't they? You no longer see differences as differences. You see them as right and wrong. Everything that they do, you see in a negative light. And that type of thinking needs to stop. It really does, doesn't it? There needs to begin a hard change. And that heart change starts with yourself. Gary Thomas says it this way, if I really wanted to see God transform me from the inside out, I'd need to concentrate on changing myself rather than changing my spouse. In fact, you might even say, and, and this is, listen, this is hard to believe, but it's, it's true, that the more difficult my spouse proved to be, the more opportunity I'd have to grow. Is, is that your attitude? Is that my attitude? 
that the more difficult my spouse proved to be, the more opportunity I'd have to grow. And just as physical exercise needs to be somewhat strenuous, so relational exercise may need to be a bit rigorous to truly stress test the heart of faith. Rigorous relational exercise. So what is it that produces a marriage of unity and understanding and of love? This kind of marriage is the result of a lifelong commitment to daily marital work and a deep trust in God's transforming grace. God's transforming grace. What does it take to deal honestly with your sin, weakness, and failure? Hard work and trust. What does it take to make growth and change a part of your daily agenda? Hard work and trust. What does it take to understand and to deal with the differences with appreciation and grace? Hard work and trust. It is a lifelong lifestyle of really trusting in God's transforming grace, which really does give you everything that you need to do the work that God has called you to as a husband and as a wife. Well, listening well involves more than just listening. It involves understanding the other person and how God has wired them uniquely. Do the hard work of getting to understand that. Listening well involves more than just listening. It involves understanding yourself and that you bring into the marriage relationship or any other relationship a fallen nature, one that has a propensity to sin. We have the victory because of what Christ did on the cross, but sometimes it just see, continues to seep out, that selfish and self-centeredness. Listening well involves more than just listening. This afternoon, the Super Bowl will be taking place, two franchises battling on the gridiron to see who will be number one, which brother will be on top. Much of the world will be watching this event. And in our marriages, all too often it can be similar. Two individuals not working together as a team, as allies, but as enemies. Battling out on the gridiron of life. Fighting to see who's going to be number one. Whose rights are going to be on top. This battle happens not in the front of the world's eyes, but all too often it happens in front of the children. Get some help sooner than later. Whether you have kids at the home, in the home still or not, get some help sooner than later. Don't settle for surviving. Seek to thrive in your marriage. With God's help, you can do that. Do the hard work of trusting in God's transforming grace. Will you close with me now in prayer? Father, we thank you for your presence here with us. We thank you for the communion table that reminds us of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. The power of sin is broken in our lives. But Father, all too often we can find that selfishness, that sin, hurting those that we love. God, help us. God, transform us. God, help each couple here to surrender their marriage to you on a daily basis, looking for you, to you, to help you, help them. Father, thank you for your presence on a daily basis with us in that transforming grace. We trust it to do its work as we trust you. Amen. Well, you are dismissed. Have a great rest of the day.